Welcome to this week's episode of the Penny Lane Podcast with Coach Dipka and Adam Sliver, presented to you by Penny's Going and Wrong. The stock market is hotter than ever right now, and traders are taking advantage. But what does that mean for the people who still haven't started trading? The market can be a little intimidating at first, but you don't have to be alone in the learning experience. We at the Pennies Going In Raw podcast are here to help you. I'm Dan, and with my co-host Hugh Henney, we make the stock market a fun but informative experience for our listeners. We offer knowledge for all levels of traders, from beginners to those who do it full-time. On PGIR, we discuss up-to-date news about the stock market and interview other traders who all started out just like us and made it big. You'll hear from Hugh and other multi-millionaire traders, founders and CEOs of companies, Fintwit superstars, and even professional athletes. Have you ever thought about investing your hard-earned cash but don't know where to start? Do you have money just sitting in your savings account collecting dust? We were all there once too. Listen to Pennies Going In Raw on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Penny Lane Podcast with Coach Jipka and Adam Sliver. Also, we have our, our best friend Ellis back in the house helping hello, us out. Hello, Hi, Ellis. How are you? Ah, uh, you know, just having fun, you know, just playing some Halo, yelling at 14-year-old kids, you know. Cool, fun. cool. I uh, <laughs> ask Ellis on Friday if he wanted to do a podcast on Friday and he said he couldn't because he had to go out and party. Yep. Which, and I, which I appreciate. <laughs> and I woke up sick on Saturday. So. Perfect. <laughs> yep. Well, Adam and Dipka, we're certainly thrilled to have you. We've had so many people request to get you on the podcast. So thank you for making the time. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, equally as excited to be here and especially with coach I mean just been a great team uh, thank you for the invite yeah absolutely uh usually I like to start by just if you could give me the real Cliffs notes version of how you both got into trading people love hearing that and so do I <laughs> yes yeah, sure um I actually started paper trading in 2018 when I was about like 17 18 um fast for or I would say 18 19 yeah Fast forward, you know, four years later, and I graduated Penn State in May. Oh, uh, congratulations. Oh, you're from PA. Yeah, I know. You're from Philly, right? Okay, cool, That's cool, funny. cool. Um, yeah, so I graduated from Penn State in May. I had an, a job offer at Oracle, but, you know, my paper trading account was doing really well. Um, and then when COVID sort of happened my senior year, I decided to, you know, put some real money into the markets. I actually started with just a $1,700 bond. Um, and then I was able to get that up to PDT during the school year. And when it was time to make a decision on, you know, whether I was going to accept the job offer or not in the winter that year, I actually declined it because I, I really wanted to go all in on trading. Um, and you know, since then there's been ups and downs for sure, but I'm definitely glad to have, you know, stuck with it because I've turned that now to like almost 300 K in about a year and a half. So I'm that's amazing on a great road. I feel like really, really great. So for me, I got into the markets. Um, I started trading commons probably about 2019 and quickly got into options following that but before that i was into flipping sneakers and oh really yes indeed oh that's awesome <laughs> yeah that's cool that's cool that's awesome so that really got me in the flow for markets right and if you go look at StockX in its infancy that's uh -huh. what started to get me obsessed with with markets and buying and selling holding things that are valuable and then uh, even built some strategies there that ended up working out really well. But I'm what, sure. I, what I loved about the markets was you get out what you put in. And if I can just put in the work here and, and build something great that that helps me succeed, you know, I'll put in all that work and, and I'll do it. And um, so starting in 2019, you know, I've gone through some phases of only commons, only options. You know, I've traded small caps before, but really found my flow with just a uh, simplistic approach of taking a few stocks every day, blocking out the noise and playing your plan. Um, fell in love with it, still in love with it. I, I love that story. 
So, um, do you guys want to just hear where it's the beginning of December 2021? Do you guys just want to talk to me a little bit about what you think is going on in the market in general and, you know, kind of how it's been affecting you and sort of what you see going into the end of the year? Yeah, sure. So I'll start with this one. This is Dipka, by the way. Um, actually, I was talking to Blaine just uh, 10, 20 minutes ago about how I actually quit trading um, just about 14 months ago in October. And my one year anniversary is coming up on December 7th of when I got back into the market with 27K. So I struggled a lot trading penny stocks from that October time to December. And uh-huh. I decided to get back in because of what we call, you know, the Santa rally. A lot of people hype it up. It's usually a good time to trade. One of my one of the best months historically for, you know, small caps. So I got back in with 27K because I wanted a little bit of room just over PDT. You know, that building that cushion. So I, I came back in with like 27K. Um, I got the extra 2K from door dashing. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, nice. Let's go. You're a hustler. <laughs> I know, I know. So in October, like I was, or I would say August, I had about 24K. And by September, I got over 25. So I hit the PDT, right? So I'm like, all right, now 100K is in sight. like that's going to come quick as soon as you get over PDT, right? And the opposite happened. Anytime I would get over 25K, I was so worried about going back under that it just mentally like took me out of every trade that I was in. And I forgot like the real DD or the real due diligence behind, you know, why I was in that swing in the first place. Um, and I ended up just sitting between like 23 and 25 and a half K for, you know, two, two, three months. So I, I had to just take a mental break from it. But again, that Santa rally, uh, December, I decided to get back into it and it actually worked out. But the number one thing for me, and I know this is, I feel like this is a good time to talk about this because this past week for small caps. I know a lot of people have been struggling. The one thing that I did and I told myself going back in, I said, I need to really start appreciating these small gains and the small wins and letting them add up and just building further cushion away from that PDT level. Um, So I feel like going into December, you know, right now, obviously it was a rough market last week uh, from a macro perspective. I think, you know, I see futures are green right now. So I'm hoping I'm optimistic for a nice bounce off of that. You know, SPY was obviously at that crucial 450 level. Right. IWM was near that crucial like 210 level. So I'm I'm thinking we'll get a bounce, and I'm going to go in with them that same mindset I had last year of letting those small gains add up, trying to just build some momentum. You know, get some confidence back, and then go from there. Is that how does that affect your? I mean, I've interviewed so many traders and of course, like let your winners run is, you know, everybody who's ever traded anything knows that phrase and, uh, ask trading. Who's one of my favorite people I've ever, ever interviewed. She's great. That's a, she's incredible. Yeah. She said that when she's in a market like this, or she's feeling like a little uncertain, she's her phrase was, I see green and I take green. So both of those things combined, like it, do you, does that ever affect you or keep you from letting a trade totally play out because the market is a little shaky? I think you're going to find this really, really crazy. I actually have never had a single trade profit over $5,000. And keep in mind, I've grown from 1700 to over like 300 K now. And I've Uh never had one single trade go over $5,000. So I really pride myself on the small gains add up. Uh And, you know, I'll like, if I see $100, that's $100. I, I, you know, I'll take it off the table. Obviously, um, I like to try to let things run and I've been working on it, especially with the following that I've had because it's, it's the way I trade is less traditional and I'm really trying to, you know, teach people. And it's hard to do that with such a unique style that really doesn't work for everyone. So I've been holding on to some more runners, but um, I would say my best single single day came in October, which was 13K. But I see a lot of people in, in my own Discord who are outperforming me like on a single day. But the thing that I can attest or, you know, pat myself on the back for is that I've only had like two, uh, two or three red days 
since I would say August. And they've been very, very minimal. Um, my last loss over $500 was in June. So wow. that's something I really pride myself on. But I trust me, I've struggled at times. There's been days where I've had, you know, $50 losses like three days in a row. And I, that feels like a major loss to me just based on my style. Is your style or strategy something that you could explain to us verbally yes. on the podcast? Would you, so, would you be willing to do it? Yeah. So I actually, I actually have a, a discord Kane capital. Adam is in there with me. Um, I actually live trade a lot. So I go on there and I will say what I'm buying, you know, right on spot. There's no hiding from losses. So the members have really gotten some good education out of that as well, because I f- feel like that's unique where a lot of people don't um, literally live trade in front of, you know, hundreds of other people. Right. But when people ask me about my specific style, it's not like I don't really have one answer for you, but I, I think the best way to put it would be trading the trend or what I like to call wherever the money is. So I started out trading small cap commons, but and that worked out for me. You know, like the Santa Rally came around last December. I got in at a good time. It worked for me. I built up some cushion and then obviously the meme squeeze happened. That was um, a big boost for my account that whole month. Um, but then actually March and April came around and I had lost my single biggest loss in a day was, was March, uh, the end of March. I lost $22,000 on AI, which was just devastating for me. I, Remember, I was a senior in college. So that was like my tuition, my room and board at the time. Yeah. Um, that was a big reality check for me. So I had to create sort of uh, a style from there. And I would say for small caps, it was like that base hit mentality, momentum trading. And then when April came around, I realized I couldn't just be a penny stock trader because it doesn't always work. You need to be able to trade multiple things. So I moved into options and I started learning, learning that large caps, shorting, large caps, you know, puts, all that sort of thing. So yeah, I would say my style is basically just trading the trend, whatever's hot. I, I, I'm really good at recognizing where the money is and where it's easier to win. Uh, and how do you do that? So one of the tricks that I have, I use this pre-market scanner, investing.com. Um, I'm happy to you know share the link with you. And I actually arrange the percentage gainers. Um, you know, I, I arrange them in order. So you'll get whatever's up the most percentage wise that morning from okay. top to bottom. And I usually look for at least three penny, I don't want to say penny stocks, small caps. So anything, you know, from a 50 cents to 15 to, you know, maybe $20 in that range. I look for at least three stocks over 50% gain by 8.30 Eastern time. And what I've noticed is when you don't have those gainers, when you don't have at least two of them over 50%, you really don't have a lot of momentum and it's a lot harder to win in the penny market. What I also do is I adjust my sizing accordingly. So if anyone is familiar with think or swim buttons, it, you literally have your quantity, like the amount of shares you're going to buy. I have like uh-huh. five different charts. So I have a chart for my penny stocks and all I have to do is just adjust the ticker. But those, those, the quantity of shares will be already like predetermined. It's, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it also helps me be fast. It helps with the speed. But when I see three things up over 50%, I'll actually double my my size. So what I try to do is take advantage of the days where it looks like it's going to be a hot day. And then when it looks when I don't have um, my requirements met, the three stocks over 50% gain in the morning, I actually you know dial it back. So I, I reduce my quantity. Um, or the you know the dollar amount that I'll be trading with that day, which I feel like that really helps me because I'm capitalizing on the days where the market is hot, and I'm you know mitigating my risk on the days where the market has is cooler. That's pretty smart. Now, do yeah. you use uh, like Active Trader on Tinkerswim? Is that what you're talking about by the buttons? It's similar. It's it's just as fast as Active Trader. It's not. Okay. So I use um, let me see. I use Flexible Grid. And okay. I have one, two, three, four. I have four on one screen and four on the other. And then on the side, I literally just hit buttons. And then I have buy market, buy the ask, join the bid, sell market. Okay. Um, yeah. Right there. And I could just type in the quantity. And it yeah, that's what I did. So I have the same way. And I always tell myself, like, hey, if this is not hot, like, I'm just going to cut down my size in half. Yep. 
Like even on contracts, like I'm used to buying like 25, 50 contracts at a time, but the VIX is over 30. I'm going to buy like five or 10. Yes, exactly. I'll yeah. also use the, you know, the major in indexes to help me with that as well. Yeah, that's it. I think about that in a very similar way. And coach, something that you spoke to earlier about the, the Santa run question, I agree with, with what you said. So my way that I'm looking at the, the short term future is that people have a lot of expectations coming into, you know, anything, honestly, in life, people have expectations. And if people are expecting the Santa rally to happen, suppose it doesn't happen. What does that do to us? Right? Where does that put our mentality? Where does that put our emotions? When when more people are thinking something's going to happen, then it's almost that much harder for it to actually happen. So, oh my gosh, are you actually talking about the Georgia football game last night? <laughs> <laughs> yes. anyway, strong correlation. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, they haven't allowed 14 points in an entire game. So, why don't we just do that in the second quarter, right? <laughs> Adam, uh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, just really, that was triggering for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Adam, you, you, you bring up like such a great point, and this is a great time to talk about this. Last Friday, I had one of my better options calls. Um, it was an ODTE spy lotto, and obviously everyone was at the edge of their seat Friday around power hour, like 3.30, 3.40, watching that 4.50 level on spy um, try to hold. I, all over my Twitter feed, I just saw, you know, crashes coming. If we break 450, we're, we're doomed. So I, you know, I wish I trusted my gut more, but that, that told me that that's my number one indicator. When people are crying, I love to, you know, go the opposite way. And that's usually a good indicator to buy the dip for me. So yeah. I bought the, uh, I bought some calls on spy. There was only 20 minutes to ex, expiration. So I really, treaded small there, but it ended up running like three, four hundred percent. But that's a great like testament to Adam's point that when everyone else is fearful, you really have to be greedy. I mean that that is the number one thing that has not changed throughout the market's history, I feel like. You're the first person I've ever talked to, a fellow trader, who does exactly what I do. When everyone on Twitter is complaining, bitching, saying the crash is coming, I'm buying the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> because it's all about sediment, right? Like you guys talked about how like the Santa rally, right? And turkey runners and everyone thinks all these things are going to happen. You have people commenting saying spies going to 400. Like we're at the 50 SMA. All that candle at the end of day Friday was all the hedge funds rolling off all their VIX spreads and everything like that. So it's it's it made me smile. I was kind of like sitting here like, yes, someone finally does exactly what I do. Wait, I let I me alone. ask. I thought you're um, actually never mind. This is not <laughs> this is not helpful. Keep going. No, say it. <laughs> I can't. Okay. I just can't. <laughs> I'm a perma bull for the rest of my life until we get back to 200. But no, that's right. really great. I, I'm happy that you said that because it's so true. And I did the same exact thing. I think I loaded calls at like 345 on Friday with like 15 minutes less expiration, made like 300% and went through the clubs. So That's awesome. Something I'd say that is just super underrated. And everybody talks about emotions, but if you're not thinking about your emotions constantly while you're trading and, and keeping yourself in check, like – Sure. I mean, I'm sure you felt great after those 300% in two minutes, you know, <laughs> but it's something that has really been a mentality for me throughout my entire trading um, journey has just been don't get too high with the highs or too low with the lows. Um, if, if you feel low, then size down, just like you all were talking about a second ago, size down, hit some base hits. Get those, you know, those small wins that add up. This can be small caps. This can be options. This can be whatever you want it to be. Take those small victories. Have that build up your confidence. And, you know, if you're if you're high with the highs, recognize it, humble yourself, and bring yourself back down to earth. And the people who keep those things in check are the ones that survive past any expectation or or any market, at least in my opinion. I have said this on so many um, podcasts before, but I'm going to say it again because I think it bears repeating. I really like the phrase, there are 
old traders and there are bold traders, but there are no old, bold traders, which I think is applicable there. Like you, if you get, if you're too bold and too excited, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for you to have a lot of long longevity in the game. Yeah, exactly. And right. This is all about consistency. So a little bit about my strategy um, and me and me and coach, work a little bit together with uh with options in particular so me i I don't trade small caps i know this is this is penny lane right Um, (laughs) well that that title's up in the air (laughs) (laughs) large Large cap cap options lane (laughs) it flows really nicely (laughs) yeah (laughs) super highly levered financial derivatives anyways I uh, I stick to large cap options and like coach said, taking those base hits, the base hits add up and, you know, every day I'm putting together new levels to take calls or puts off of and then educating for a strategy uh, of execution. And I really just try to keep it so simple because I'm a firm believer that anybody can do this. Anybody can be a full-time trader if they want to be and if they put their mind through what they need to. And, you know, my, my main thing is just educating people to be able to execute on these because, you know, large caps will always move. You can make money either way on a large cap, any given day, even the, even spy, right? If you become really good at spy, you can make money on spy every single day. And it's that keeping that, keeping that consistency that, that really is my style. Yeah, Adam, to your point, going back to my story, you know, in in uh, end of March last year when, you know, after the AMC GME squeeze, when small caps got sort of attacked and crushed, anybody remembers uh, knifing in April. That was like my realization where I I saw that the money was moving into large caps and I'm like, I don't know how to trade this right now. I'm really one dimensional and I need to I need to learn. Because like you said, that is something that is always moving. There's always money somewhere in the markets. You just have to find out where it is and be able to adapt and trade um, whatever way way that is. Like, for example, I, I called penny stocks like knife April last last year. Yeah, yeah. I was able to short like I would have made so much money because I knew when things were going down. I was just honestly a little newer to that idea and I didn't really want to, you know, jump into that ring after seeing what happened with AMC and GME. But yeah, and it makes a great point about, you know, you're not, you, you can trade large caps literally forever. Yeah. And the thing we can't control the market, right? Coach, you know, we, we can't control where this money is going. All we can do is watch it and we can, we can take note. And what we need to do is build a strategy where we can have that consistency. It's consistency uh, of the mind. You know, where am I going to have my hard stop? Where am I going to be scaling? I mean, for for me, it's going to be a little bit different than it is for coach. But if you can institute something into your strategy with a good risk to reward, with a solid uh, list of rules, and you, you abide by it, and you stick to your discipline every single day, that's how you find consistency in an inconsistent market. Yeah. And Adam, you make, you, you also bring up another good point about rules. I find personally that the only time I really am losing any significant amount of money is when I'm sort of treading away from those rules. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. Absolutely. And man, oh, even, sure. even if I take wins on plays that I broke my rules, like averaging down, you know, if I average down a bunch and I still win, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Right. You got right. lucky almost. Now, what are your rules? If you haven't, like, anyone come up at the top of your head? Uh, <laughs> there's some, there's some do's and there's some don'ts, right? You know, the, the, the don'ts look a lot like don't average down. Uh, I don't hold overnight unless it's some sort of runner in a position that I've already taken a lot of gains on. Um, and then there are certain stocks that I just choose not to play. Like what? Like NVIDIA, which I <laughs> just recently decided I don't like. <laughs> I love NVIDIA. That's my biggest gainer. I know. Of, uh, We've had this conversation so many times. <laughs> I don't like it. You're a big fan. <laughs> what stock do you hate the most, Adam? Oh, man. 
a while ago it was snow. Oh, mm. I've been burned so many times by snow. <laughs> Condoms only for me. burn bad. Yeah. It's just that there are some stocks, and, and, and again, this speaks to consistency as well. There's some that, that everything has a different personality. You know, if Ellis loves NVIDIA and he's great with its personality, then he should be trading it a few days a week. But if, right. Blaine, if Blaine hates it and can't ever seem to get it right, then she shouldn't trade it. But that for me, that's Tesla. I'm not good with Tesla's price action, and I just avoid it. I've been having so much fun trading lucid lcid i think it like it seems like a fairly kind of beginner's <laughs> stock and it seems to do you know things that it should do it's shown a lot of strength i i totally agree with you i wouldn't even say it's a beginner stock i think it's just like it has a lot of strength and it's like it's moving nicely honestly it's not shopping as much as like some of the other names and yeah, just staying in a steady trend. I, I noticed a couple of weeks ago, I was having a problem where stocks would sort of just move in one direction one day. So if you're more more so if you're swinging anything overnight, things would overextend and then you would wake up and they would almost like need a pullback because they were getting so overextended in one day. But I would almost rather see Lucid go up like 3% Monday, 2% Tuesday you know, 5% Wednesday rather than it go up like 12% Monday down 5% Tuesday and then back up. It's just a little choppy. Yeah. I wasn't actually expecting that most recent pullback that it had. Like I really thought it was going to have all time highs. I mean, end of last week, early this week, and then it had that pullback, but you know. Yeah. I think the, the macro, like the Spy obviously come down didn't help. IWM got cr- just the market didn't help as a whole. I did want to died. Yeah, everything just <laughs> fell. Off. Vix is ripping though. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. I did. Penny, uh, not Penny. I'm sorry, Blaine. Either one works. <laughs> okay. I did want to touch on something with sort of the rules that I don't. It's not necessarily rules, but I feel like this is applicable to a lot of small cap traders out here. If you don't mind. Please, please. So I actually posted a tweet. I just went back and found it. This is about a week ago um, about the five major lessons that I learned. And I I can you know tell you almost to the day what stocks these were, the prices they were trading at, how much I lost on them. Um, and I even wrote them down for wash sales purposes. But Mara in August of 2020. So I actually sold it the lowest it ever went from that day forward. So it has never been as low as <laughs> down to the cent that I sold it at. Um, that was at minus 2K. That taught me the lesson of, you know, not waking up at 4 a.m. on Weeble to uh, try and trade on your phone. Um, that was just more of FOMO, honestly. I, w- I would have been better off waking up uh, 8 a.m., whatever. Number two was uh, KTOV. That taught me about offerings and sort of the fundamentals of penny stocks. So that was a, a lesson I took early on. I gave back 3.5K um, in 2020 when KTOV did that offering. I remember PJ Matlock actually like kind of called it out. He's like, the price action looks a little weird. And that's something that I can identify now a year later. But you know, when I was starting out, I couldn't. Number three was AI, and Adam kind of just talked about this with his rules, was um, buying the knife or sort of just keep adding dips. That's what I did. That's how I lost $22,000 in March of 2020. I bought AI at about like 13 bucks. I kept slapping it as the knife was going further and further down. So that is now on, you know, these lessons have basically helped me form like a rules list of what not to do. And I love keeping them in my back pocket, in my head, so that I don't repeat those same mistakes. Um, And then let's see, Genus. So I lost 7,000 on Genus in April. Um, That was me buying the news. So that was one of the lessons I learned just, you know, when everyone is on a stock, when everyone knows about the news, that's that's a no-go. You know, you want something unexpected and not overcrowded. That's... You know, if you if you saw CFVI on Friday, how it ran, but everyone was talking about it on Thursday and it did nothing. No one was talking about it on Friday and it ran like forty uh, percent. So I think that was something interesting. Um, and then number five on my list of rules is um, board trading. So if you're bored, 
you got to just walk away from the computer. If you don't see a setup, I think this is a quote from Adam. He actually talks about like letting the trade come to you. If you find yourself looking for a trade, you totally know you're in the wrong mindset at that day. Uh, that's helped me a lot. So shout out Kamish for that one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, man, my, I really only trade for the first one and a half to two hours and I just get out and enjoy the day. Um, that's, that's also one of, one of my rules. As soon as I'm kind of looking for something, the ability to identify it and then say, okay, I'm looking for something, I'm going to (laughs) stop for me that that's been huge. But with these watch lists that, that I'm talking about, there's a very prescribed strategy that I abide by and that I want people to abide by. And it almost sets you up for the ability to walk away. It says, if it's between my levels, I'm just not going to touch it. If it breaks out of the levels, then it gives me opportunities, you know, X, Y, and Z. And if it doesn't do any of that, or if it goes back below my level after I enter, I just cut for a small loss and move on. Um, That's what coach is saying is, is exactly right. It's, just being able to regulate yourself, especially in a market that's crazy and weird, like what we're seeing right now um, is so important. I I applaud you honestly on your, on your self-control for being able to walk away from the market. I, I find myself like glued to the desk until five. That's me too. Yeah. I've lost so much money from being (laughs) bored. Now that you brought up your rule five, Thinking back, like there used to be times when I first started, I'd be like, look at every single Discord, like what's everyone on? What's everyone <laughs> yeah. doing? And then, and then I, every time I talk one of those plays, I lost because everyone's already out and I got bagged. So yeah. that's interesting. And, and yeah. by the time the play comes out, usually those algos will be able to buy it before you as well. So oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm on Robinhood, so it's like a 10 cent spread. So I'm going to slap <laughs> the absolute top and there goes my account. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're trading oh, yeah. Sadly. Like uh, Friday was a perfect example of being like, I was so bored and like, like spy would drop like 0.1%. My put would go 20%, pop back up. And then it would be red. And it was just, a, it was a mess. Just nothing's going on. Oh I should yeah. Have just stepped away. Took a big L, but yeah. One right. thing that that's helped me. And I know it sounds kind of like stupid or foolish, but I try to, I'll, when I'm bored, I, I find that I can't walk away like Adam does. I don't do a good job of that. I always feel like I'll be missing something. So instead, I'll just play with like very, very small side and I'll take mental notes like, all right, if I hit this trade, like I'll buy myself like Chipotle or lunch or something. That just sort of helps me entertain myself, but also not jeopardize my account. You don't play Halo? Right. <laughs> so I actually was just playing before this. That's why I was late for this meeting. The new one though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Halo Infinite. Yeah. Mitch and I play Call of Duty and uh and Halo together while the market's slow. So I think mean, he comes back for power hour and then does whatever he wants to do. So coach, how did you start your Discord? We haven't we haven't covered oh, yeah, that yet. Lore. So my myself, my my two good friends who went to Penn State, one of them's working at uh Vanguard, I believe, and the other one's getting his MBA. Diamond Trades on Twitter. He's got a good following and Money Mander. Money Mandered is a, a very good trader. He specializes in spy. He's mastered it. So he'll have something to trade for the rest of his life, honestly. But we have a group chat um, and we've been trading options for some time now, especially them. They sort of got me hooked. They taught me a lot about like Fibonacci retracements and key levels and all that. Um, Mander taught me a lot about SPY and how he uses the EMAs to trade that. But we would put our plays in this text group chat and you know we were doing really well. I mean, obviously our, our portfolios were doing pretty well, but our picks were doing really well. And we saw a lot of people on, I saw a lot of people on Twitter, you know, having quit my job, not quit my job, but not accepting that full-time role and being all in on trading, I was like, you know, we're doing really well, honestly, better than a lot of these people that I see on Twitter. Why don't we try to get involved here and like pay it forward and, you know, teach what we've learned because we have some pretty cool stories. You know, I started with a $1,700 bond. I feel like that was really relatable for a lot of people on Twitter. And that's kind of what got me popular is that people like to see someone who started, you know, from the bottom per se, account wise. 
Mm-hmm. So I feel like that was relatable for people. And then I will say we did get some we did get some love from Zach Morris. Um, oh, nice. And, yeah, he's he's a great dude. I was actually. So I don't want to say harassing, but I was messaging him a lot like, dude, check out my trades today. Like you got to let me an Atlas. And he actually, he actually would message me back a lot, like encouraging stuff and, you know, what he's seeing a couple of times in the market and some of the stuff he uses. But he actually was like, dude, you are a good trader. Like you don't need to be an Atlas. Like you can start your own thing. So that also sort of lit the, lit the fire to begin our own discord. But it's That's just awesome. been a slow build, honestly, and I feel like the members are getting a kick out of it. Adam has helped a lot because he would post his watch list in there, so that brought a lot of traffic. I would do the live trading, which I feel like was unique because you know I would actually post exits, whereas other people wouldn't, and they have their reasons, of course, like they have a lot of money, so that could affect the stock or whatnot. But for me, tra- you know, I, I don't trade with it. Like I said, I never had a gain over five thousand dollars. Um, I just try to make a thousand a day, so um, I'm able to alert my exits just fine. And I feel like part of that is the educational reasons. Um, you know, I like to show when I scale out because that's at resistance levels, and that helps a lot of people because you know they'll let plays go from like up fifty percent to then it'll turn red on them. So I, I just think being relatable to a lot of these members has helped us grow a lot. Adam has helped us grow a lot. Unusual Wells, Zach Morris. So a lot of things. It's a culmination of things. That's amazing. Coach. Yeah. You, you said a number of great things that I want to speak to. Uh, first off, I owe you a lot of respect and, and gratitude for, for really pushing my watch list. And, you know, you're playing them on a regular basis. And I can't thank you enough, man, for really just uh, – putting people in the position to succeed with them, which is, which has been awesome. I appreciate uh, so. it. Dude, your work is great. Like that's not, even if with me pushing, it, it's not working unless your watch list was on fire. And obviously you see how many people are raving over it. So. <laughs> well, thank you. But here's, here's the thing. You say you haven't had a big gainer over $5,000, right? But your account balance stands to prove that you don't need home runs to be incredibly successful And the people that I want teaching others about the things that I do is someone who's trading like a robot. You know, you're the, you're, you're scaling at 50%. You're not looking for the crazy runners. You know, you're making a thousand dollars a day, which is probably negligible for, for your, an account of your size. And so you're, you're trading it and you're just following the plan, which is, which is awesome. And then the last thing is relatable. I think when people can realize that that they can do this themselves, that it is, I mean, it's not simple, but if you can put together a way in a simplistic form that you can do this, it it's so encouraging. And that's when the light bulb flips for a lot of people, right? And coach, you've done that for so many. And uh, hopefully I've done that as well. And it's just been incredible to see. Appreciate that. And I will say, sometimes I feel like it bites me where – you know, I don't have, I have a, you know, my hit rate in the discord this week was like 77% on my plays, something like that, which is great. But I have other traders in my discord who are my friends. And I actually had stock sniper. He's been, he blew up on Twitter this week, actually a little bit for his uh, 800% play. So I don't have the flashy percentage gains like that. He actually passed me in my discord for alert signups today. I was a little salty, but all love. <laughs> He's a great trader. But I will say the uh, the retail community they do love those flashy you know big home run plays and I don't you know I'll have hundred percent plays um, almost every day but those are usually where I'll, I'll only have runners left I'll never have like a major position left running after about fifty percent gain but no you know, that's just my style it works for me so. Hundred percenters are like boring now. Everyone's like, "Oh, I need two thousand, five thousand, no. <laughs> and like if you have twenty five contracts of Apple and you're making fifty percent to one hundred percent, that's a lot of money." Like I know kids yeah, who is. like they like hold one contract so it's for it to absolutely go to the moon to post on Twitter. Like I don't really care about percent gain. Like did I win? Yes or no? And it shows that you guys are humble like that because a lot of people nowadays only care about those big gains. Yeah. But it's not realistic for options. It gives options and large cap people a bad look, I think. Yeah. 
I will say Sniper Sniper even said to your point about the two everyone wants the two thousand percent gain. He was joking around. Um I had a I had like a hundred percent runner and I was happy. He's like, Oh man, like he was just busting my chops. He was like, hundred percent is like the new twenty percent or something. <laughs> it's, like five. it's like a it's like a scalp. It's like yeah. it's gross. That's facts. <laughs> That's not how I learned. I learned scaling out twenty five, fifty, seventy five, one hundred, like in twenty five percent increments. That's what my mentor taught me in large caps, and that's what I stick to today. Too many Absolutely. people just hold like diamond hands, bro. I'm like yeah. it doesn't actually work like that in a market like this because. If we're down Friday, down Monday, you are down both days and mega clap both days. So. Yeah, and I'm all for the I'm all for the the giant gains, but at like like Penny said, not Penny again. I'm sorry. Oh no, <laughs> it's not. I call her Penny, and she has my phone number. Okay, I, <laughs> Penny on weekend, I didn't even know. <laughs> but like she said, it's all about long, longevity, and in the end, you know those base hits and just compounding your gains and building up your account is going to get you so far. I know it's not the fastest route, but it it works. It really does. And I I can prove it to you, you know, hopefully with my story. I have a question for you. What would you say is harder for people, entries or exits? And why do you think the uh, – whatever Ooh. your answer is, why do you think? Yeah, I, w- I would say – I would say the exits is harder for me because I I don't trade with like a ridiculous amount of money. And I always usually have room to – to average down if I want, but that also helps me because every time I see my play going down and I still have the capital to like add more. So what I tell my discord members is I'll always post a starter. I will never, not never, but rarely say high confidence when I alert something, I'll always say starter. Um, That's just because I know that mentally it's a win-win situation, right? If you go into the trade And you sort of expect to see a dip and it goes up, you're like satisfied. So I always give myself some room. And if it, say I'm trying to add at a key level and it goes below, right? I really am able to, I have that capital and I have that mindset where I'm like, okay, I can average down here, but it makes me second guess. You know, do I want to average down though? Is the setup there? Is it holding that key level that I wanted it to hold? So the entries, um, I feel like are a little bit easier for me, whereas the exits, like you said, I do get a little, you know, not that I'm like blowing up on Twitter, but I have a decent following and I do want to post some of those like high percentage gains. I just figured out how to use Weeble cards. Oh yeah, those are amazing. Yeah. Love them. <laughs> so I, I try to like, try to hold them a little longer, but again, it just, it's a little outside of my personal comfort zone to hold like past a hundred, 200%. You know, I've never... I've had tons of plays that ran 1,000, 2,000, even 3,000% on me. One was lucid a couple weeks ago. But again, like I just won't hold that long. So I would say exits is definitely the toughest for me, just especially after you exit and you see it keep going. Oh, nothing's worse. But you seem yeah. like a realistic guy. So my thing on Twitter is I see a lot of people, there's like the fakes and then like the real ones. And you guys are obviously real because you're not out there flexing these huge gains. You're telling your followers like, Hey, I'm booking profits the whole way up. Like there's a lot of uh, like flashiness as you described it in the whole like fin to a community. And it's always nice to hear someone be realistic. Like you even post your exits. I don't know many people that post their exits. Yeah. <laughs> right? I love that. A lot of my followers don't listen to me, which is obviously like totally entitled to do that. But they yeah. know that I'll sell things pretty early, and they'll they'll end up, uh, you know, tagging me, being like, "Coach, thanks. This went five hundred percent." What are you talking about? Like, I sold it for twenty five. Nothing's worse than when someone banks bigger in your own play, dude. Nothing's worse. It's like, I hey know. man, congratulations, but you're like grinding your teeth. You're like, ah, you got paper yep. hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Coach has paper hands for sure. Now, if if you didn't post the Weeble card, did you actually take the trade? No, of course. Exactly. Not. <laughs> That's also true. I love um, those things, but they're kind of toxic at this point. Oh yeah. Well, see. Okay. So what I do at the end of every day, I'll post the, and I'll even say it. I'll say possible results from trigger. You know, I don't want people thinking that these. I hit all of these. You know, because I really only take one position at a time. I'm. I want to see one through, right? That's just kind of, that's another one of my rules. One, maybe two, but 
I post, you know, possible results from trigger, right? So I'm just doing math. I'm saying, you know, logical high of day divided by logical point, you know, from the trigger entry price on the contract and then minus one, right? Gives you percent gain. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, realistically, I'm doing kind of something similar to you, Ellis. I'm, I'm 25, mine is about 20% and then maybe, you know, 35, 40%. And then at that point I have a stop set for, probably 30 percent on the last third and i'll let it go yep um but yeah same very what I, same what i do but it's i think with people like my thing is like when a stock hits like 50 percent on an option right your stop should be at break even like like they, they exactly. immediately break even but i know people it's like hey man these are up like 300 percent, and now i'm down 50 percent. what should i do <laughs> i'm like I, I don't even know how to help you sometimes like i almost get frustrated it's like dude you see money, take money. If someone hands you $500 cash, right? You can tell them, no, you want 2000 But the risk is you wake up the next morning and all that money is gone. Yeah. Like, it's Ellis, we actually, we have a, like I mentioned, the lizard, we call him Money Mander. He, I make fun of him all the time because we're very different. He mm -hmm. will not scale a play until, like, he scaled these spy calls overnight on Friday um, his first one fourth scale was at like a hundred and forty four percent. Actually, I think this was on Wednesday. His first scale was a hundred and forty four percent, and I just like sick. I couldn't. I know I couldn't <laughs> believe it. He's streaming futures on his TV while he sleeps at night with all his money and say, "Oh man, hopefully this hits big." <laughs> yeah. It works for him though, so props to him. But it's just like it. It's not for me. I just yeah. couldn't imagine because he's had a couple that, like you said, they've. We're up 100% and they come back down to you. And I just couldn't imagine letting those gains At go. least sell half at 100% to the lesser on house money. I mean, come on. I have a, <laughs> I have a buddy who does the same thing. Same I thing. will say, though, he actually did have a 1,000 percenter on those. So I, I can't say anything. I can't bash it. Yeah. He's the GOAT. We're just we're peasants in his yeah. game. <laughs> I had a play similar to that this week, Coach. I'm, I'm sort of ashamed of it, but I had square puts on one of these days. Oof. And and my first scale was at 100%. And I, but he, he, this is something that we talked about a second ago. When do you, you know, how to know to let your winners run, right? Because I feel yeah. like a lot of people are quick to sell their winners, but they wait to sell their losers. Dude, that's so your, true. That's when so, it should be the opposite. Thing I've heard. So, what my I I love to just ask myself questions in my head, you know. Like I said earlier, I'm asking myself, "Am I looking for a trade?" Right. That's a question for me. Another, when I'm in a position, my question that I ask myself is, "Do I have a reason to get out?" That's what I'm asking myself, and I'm on the five minute looking for, you know, I'm putting support and resistance, looking at the past few days. You know, I use very few indicators. I I don't really use indicators at all. I mean. VWAP if that counts. But um I'm saying, okay, if we get, you know, I'm in the green. If we get back over this short term resistance, then I'll take more off for 20% gains, right? But if it doesn't even get there, then what's the point? So for example, Square just kept falling. It would consolidate a little bit. I'm still green, kept falling. And then I mean <laughs> When you see a hundred percent and it's staring you in the face, you have to take out half and play on house money. But um, and also to answer the question that Coach said, uh, exits to, I argue entries. Are Interesting. Harder. Or what was the question? What's harder or what's more important? What's uh, what's more difficult for people, entries or exits? From your experience, I would okay. It's not necessarily what's more difficult, but I think. What's more important to get down? I think it's entries because there's so many emotions that are flying through your head when you're about to take an entry. You're you're thinking, you know, okay, is this too expensive? Is it too cheap? Am I going to miss the run? Is there FOMO? What am I going through here? Um, what I love to see is I always preach the the retest. I want the retest. You know, if you see a level break and you see a, a confirmation candle, say a five minute closes way above your level for the breakout. Okay, well, I'm not going to chase it up there. So what I want to see is I want to see it come down. You know, I love to buy calls on red candles, puts on green candles. And 
have that patience. And if you can nail the entry, you can quite literally never be read for an entire second of your position. Yeah, I, I got to go, I gotta go back and change my answer. I totally agree with Adam. I totally. He put that really, really well. He yeah. made me change my answer too. <laughs> it also made me think back. And I also think part of the, the hardest part with the entries, to his point, you know, he makes those call put trigger lists. So a lot of times when the, the stock opens above the call level, it'll come down and test the the call level. But that is sort of a support point, right? So my what I have a hard time with is deciphering because it's going to make a big move off of a, a key level, right? Is it is it holding the level or is it going underneath? Because I, I guess I would say, am I going to add calls or puts is the hard part for me because if it gets under that level, you know, you got to be quick and get it before you get one of those nasty candles because a lot of his levels too um, will be near – I, I don't know exactly how he does the level, so I won't speak on it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't question the magician. Well, that's my next question. Yeah, how, what's the magic behind the trigger list? Great question, and you're asking me to share my my, my biggest secrets, right? So I need the answers. Okay, be yeah, be very very vague. <laughs> <laughs> very very vague. I no. flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> really, what it is is it's. It's important to take ranges into account. So I take, I look at the daily ranges of candles, you know, the daily candles, like what is this, you know, what is uh, Boeing capable of moving in a day, you know, on an average, you know, I'm eliminating the outliers from the, from the daily candles. And I'm just looking, what does an average day look like for Boeing? And then I'm taking a certain percentage of that move, um, about 20 to 25% of that daily move. And I'm, taking that as the range that I want my triggers to be from the market close price. Okay, that was a lot of words. But basically, finding um, a nice little sweet spot to put these support and resistances at, you know, to look for them in. Because for, uh, for options, you don't want it to be too far away in a day to where you know, the moves already happen. And you don't want it to be too close to where you're going to get faked out. And it, it's it's really about just finding that that balance zone, and uh, that's where all my thought process goes. Is like, am I finding the perfect balance? And what coach said, you know, say there's a gap up, right? A lot of people just want to slap it as soon as it happens. But I say no, let's let it pull back. Let's get that retest, and almost to the T, you'll see these levels get touched, and it's awesome. And but the the question is, or am I taking calls on a bounce or am I taking puts on on a flush? And that's where it just comes into repetition. You, know, you need to just be looking at these charts. You need to be playing it out in your head, simulating it. And for me, kind of the, the aha moment was when I just started putting things on a chart because it's super ominous and uh, intimidating. When you're just like, okay, well, how do I go about trusting my own levels? I just tell people, do it. Force yourself to do it and just observe. And you'll see incredible things can happen. Now, do you use like an ATR type strategy, like ultra range? Is that sort of how you get your Similar, basis, something similar? similar. Okay, yeah. yeah. Penny, do you know what ATR means? No. So basically it's... uh. Like what's the daily range of a stock? So let's say like Boeing. Boeing can sometimes move pretty violently. Same with Tesla, where you look at like a Pfizer, which is on my watch list. Watch list. <clears throat> Me too. Very nice setup. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I coughed because it's a it's a vaccine stock, you know. Oh. Yeah. Oh, tough, funny. Tough, <laughs> I know, tough, <laughs> tough joke out here. But uh <laughs> you'll notice that Pfizer really doesn't move that much, right? You're not gonna get a dollar a move a day. You'll get like twenty five cents to fifty cents. So it's important to know it all ties into the personality of a stock. Like how you love CCL, right? And I hate it. Or and how you hate NVIDIA stock. and you love you think uh Lucid's like a beginner stock when I think it's one of the harder stocks to trade in the market at the moment. Oh, how funny. Yeah. I was gonna, I wanted to say that earlier. Uh, I had it in my notes. But yeah, I find Lucid very, very difficult to trade because uh, it's known to be violent, especially when you go make sandwiches and your your calls go down 50%, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know a friend who did that or? 
Uh, no, yeah, yeah, his name's me. <laughs> yeah, I went to Wawa to go get a sandwich. Right? I live in Philadelphia. I heard one of you guys talk about Penn State. Uh, my roommate's actually good at Penn State, so. Um, That's Coach. Oh, uh, Coach, yeah. Yes. Penn State guy, so. You know Wawa, right? Friends. Oh, of course. We got that in Jersey. Oh, you're from Jersey? Oh, let's go. Cool, cool, cool. Yes, sir. But interesting you guys are very very honest people i, I yeah i, I like it a lot yeah you guys are very knowledgeable too and you're very uh you have a similar mindset to to how a lot of like traders i look up to is no bs right just trade what's in front of you don't look at all the flashiness and all the noise i feel like people get lost in that i think they're gonna start trading and get a lambo the next day but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't I- happen I think the most empowering thing is when you can realize that you can do it for yourself, yep. right? That's my entire mission I hear is I just want to pe- people to feel empowered that they can do it. You know, there's nothing against taking calls of very great traders. I have nothing against that. But once you realize you can do it yourself, it, it opens up a whole new world. Yeah, I uh, I got to jump in here and just talk about this is relating to the topic. Uh, my advisor. So I have some money with, or had, I should say, some money with an advisor at Merrill, Merrill Lynch because when I lost that twenty two thousand in March, I talked about, I mm-hmm. figured I should probably protect some of my <laughs> some of my gains. Wire out, right? Yeah, exactly. Always got to wire out. Anyone December, wire out, please. So you don't get slapped in March. Sorry, yeah. Go on. But um, I actually ended up closing that account down. You know, we were witnessing or we were witnessing like one of the greatest bull markets, right, in market history. And in that same time period, my my professional advisor had my account down 12 and a half percent over, you know, the past eight, nine months. Um, I, I just I just want to encourage people that you are in control of your own you know, financial future. And like Adam said, anyone can do this. You know, this guy has a has a license. He has got all the certifications and he's got me down 12 and a half percent. Meanwhile, you know, I have no licenses, no certifications. And, you know, what I was able to do, what you guys are able to do. Um, it's just, it is incredible and inspiring, honestly. What did he buy? So, <laughs> so we, had, uh, we had Zynga, which is, I don't want to talk oh, about that one, but down 50%. Right? How how do you let something? And I also would like to note that we had covered calls, so there was downside protection, and we were still down twelve and a half percent. So that's even nice. even, cr- even crazier. Yeah. Um. What else? I had uh, Chewy. Okay. Chewy at like, I would say like eighty. It's sitting in the sixties. Uh, <laughs> international. <laughs> We bought that at 98. If you actually look, um, it went straight down from 98. <laughs> never close to recovering. What else? There were some other I'm ones. really enjoying this. I'm sorry. It's no, really yeah, great. Continue. Yeah. Continue, please. Oh, you, you guys will love this one. DraftKings. I mean. Oh, of course. Yeah, that one's getting clucked. Cl- I own that in the 20s, so. Yeah, I just Must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Must be nice. Yeah. He said, yeah, this is definitely not a head and shoulders at 64 at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely not a weekly head and shoulders at 42. I told people, like, don't buy it. Like, I closed all mine and leave the runners. I was like, head and shoulders. Sure enough, here we are. Yeah, and this is no bash on, like, I know so many people obviously have money tied up with advisors, and it's great. Yeah. And as long as you're investing and doing the right things, I think that's a great first step. For me personally, though, it just didn't make sense you know, I'm trading in the markets every day. I'm able to watch it. And who's going to care more about my money, me or someone else? So I prefer to just, you know, take it into my own hands at this point. But the ultimate point is, is that really anyone is capable of doing this like like Adam did mention. Do you invest long term now? So I, I just liquidated last week. Um, so I, I'm, I'm shopping right now. I'll be shopping this week. I will nice, be taking nice, a look. Nice. So you're I'm buying eyeing, the zip. I'm eyeing Facebook really hard. Yeah, yep. Yep. I got orders already in. I'm tingling just waiting for them to get filled. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so the meta. Well, well, the meta thing's super fascinating. Anyway. Also scary. 
but it, it, totally, totally. This is the meta. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> We're in the metaverse already. Um, do you guys have any advice for a brand new? I just opened up my Robin Hood. I've never taken a trade, but I'm looking to get into it, trader. Yes. Hit me with it. Paper trading, absolutely number one thing. Don't let your real money be your experimental account. It, I, I, I struggled honestly in the beginning when I got started like two years ago. Keep in mind with my paper trading account was mostly like large caps and stuff, but I struggle with just the layout of my brokerage. Like Thinkorswim looked like foreign language to me at Ugh, first, transferring totally. from Robinhood to Thinkorswim. Um, options, like I had no idea what those were. I didn't know, you know, the multiplier of a hundred. So I could have accidentally like bought larger quantities. I actually bought Fubo once and this is when I was pretty experienced, but like even a simple like slip of a button, adding an extra zero, I meant uh-huh. to buy like say $30,000. It was like 300 and all bought on margin. So just getting some of that rusty stuff um, out is always good. And that paper trading helps with that. I would also add as someone who just, I mean, in the last couple months learned how to trade, like I started on Robinhood, then I went to TD Ameritrade on my phone and basically just traded on my phone and then learned how to use the desktop Thinkorswim app. And I think if you're going to paper, if you're going to take that advice and paper trade, paper trade, like use Thinkorswim or use a real broker. Yes, like, do, you know what I mean? Like yeah. learn how to use the thing. Don't do what I did. It like, cause I knew how to, whew, it was really a nightmare. Take the time to do the work before you put your money on the line. Do, you know, do what I say, not what I did. Yeah. To add to coach's point, <laughs> yeah, I think the, the order execution, incredibly perfect. Paper trade, use, you know, fake money. Additionally, don't let the first time you look at charts be as soon as you put money into your brokerage account. You know, take a look at the charts, just stare at them. The the amount of time you can just stare at a screen over time, the hours will will add up and truly make a difference. I mean, you might not think it does, but just seeing it and visualizing everything, I know there's a lot of visual learners out there, incredibly important. All right, wait, Adam. I like that. If the green line on my Robinhood account keeps going up, does that count as looking at charts? <laughs> <laughs> if it goes up and to the right, good. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's doing that right now, so that's good. All right. I bought the crypto dip. <laughs> on that point, uh, one of the last episodes we released is with um, Impressive Emu, and we were talking a little bit about fibs, and I don't know very, I don't know anything about fibs, but. Um, I'm sort of tweaking my rules. They're all my rules are just constantly like a an open word document that I will, you know, tweak as things go on. And I'm thinking about adding to them based on the fib conversation. Don't trade anything unless it has a pretty chart. And I know that's like a very ambiguous thing to say, but I, it like makes a lot of sense in my mind. Like if I'm looking at a chart and I'm like, I have to really kick my mind into high gear here to figure out what's going on. I just don't think that's something I should trade. Like all my trades go better when you just look at the chart and you're like, this just feels nice. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? Or is that a, should Mm -hmm. I not add it to my rule, my rules? (laughs) I like that rule. Okay. All yeah, right. I agree. I'm getting exactly. some traction here on the rule. <laughs> Going back to your your point with like Lucy being a great mover for you, if you're seeing the price action and you like know how it moves, that's another part of my strategy that I use is I know certain stocks personalities. So I'm able to, you know, recognize what sort of a move they're gonna make. If it's not acting the way I want it to, I'm able to cut it quickly. So that's that's a great rule to add. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. All right. You're also a painter too. If it looks pretty, keep on going. If it looks ugly, right, right. I'm like, let me play to my strengths here, exactly. and that is like, I am good at pretty charts. I like my <laughs> charts to look pretty, and I like to get really get to know, you know, t- 
10 to 15 stocks and then they become my friends with the pretty charts <laughs> friends with the pretty charts you mentioned oh, before God. that you like you have an eye for like as things being aesthetic or uh, right or, right or right pleading. i like the so balance so if you look at a chart and it's balanced it looks nice in your mind it should be like okay that's a really nice chart that looks like it's good for me me i i just play opening range breakouts if i'm scalping intraday so it doesn't really matter what the chart looks like if it looks going to 10 minute and the market's going up or down i just stick with that so i got a lot of that from my uh my conversation with real simple ariel about looking at like he you know i just love his strategy but he's such a big like does this look good on the daily chart you know and if the answer is no then you don't trade that yep so yeah we're we're playing right now (laughs) he shorted ford and i i I messaged him saying i was very disappointed in him so Oh, I'm so proud of him getting out there shorting. Oh, no, 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 no. That's him. Ford. That's my long-term boomer next $100 <laughs> stock in my mind, okay? Blue chips. I love <laughs> Ford. That's my baby girl right there. <laughs> Blaine, I think much the same way. It's, I, 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 go, I usually go daily, hourly, 15-minute, and I want things that are aesthetic, right? Yeah. And, and, and if, they're, if the aesthetics work for you and then, and then you see – okay, I can find some good levels to play. You know, that's exactly the way that I think. And, um, you know, but the cool thing is, is that me, you and Ellis and coach can each look at a stock a different way, each play it a different way and still make money. Totally. Yeah, we, uh, me and Adam were on the opposite side of Spy on a Friday and <laughs> he did have me there. I'm not going to lie. I was looking for some EMA support, and he had some uh, key level drawn back, uh, probably from the daily chart or the five minute, and he he did have me there. So, props to him. That's okay, Coach. <laughs> it happens. I also <laughs> like to, you know, you can get a smaller risk to reward if something pulls back on the EMAs, like pulls way back, and you're like, well, I could buy it here, and it's a tiny risk. So like, you know, might as well take the trade. A lot of people will take those like small risk trades. And my personality is kind of like, I think Ripster also does a similar thing, is I like to kind of buy stocks that are showing a lot of strengths, even if I'm playing, if I'm buying them a little too high, just because like, I'm like, I want to, I want to buy it once it's confirmed. That it's going, you know, I like there's so many different ways to play this, just like you were saying, so many different ways to play the same thing and get good results. And I certainly have been struggling. So my way is maybe not the way, but it's interesting how you bring your own personal preferences into the stock market. One thing that I've actually been speaking about with uh, with some friends is long, just like you're saying, long relative strength plays short relative weakness plays and i would say the latter of those is probably my favorite is Uh if i if i see a play but it works vice versa right uh if i continue to see a play bouncing or dropping off of resistance you know unable to break resistance and spies ripping you know Uh i'm adding puts every single resistance touch just boom 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 like you said small risk right I'm adding yeah. them every single resistance touch and I'm playing that relative weakness because as as soon as spy sees a little tiny drop of blood, boom. You'll oh, see, I mean, the puts will just, they go burr, right? But <laughs> same, <laughs> simply put, they go burr. But, it, you know, inversely of what you're saying, right? It's if you see something like a great example was Apple this past week, you know, spy was just dumping and then. Apple's just out here ripping. I mean, Microsoft oh, is dumping. Yeah, yeah. Usually, easy. usually, my uh, Microsoft and Apple will will go together. I mean, but you see Apple just going crazy when Spy's dumping. I mean, as soon as Spy sees any green, Apple's yep. just going to go to town. Oh, I love playing that. Something that's showing like relative strength in a weak market. You know what did that this week is BBW. Love BBW. It had those great earnings and was just raging while the market was on fire oh yeah i remember those earnings but yeah i did play apple to adam's point that's one of the main things that i look for is when spy goes down i see nvidia is one of my first go uh go to's when spy makes sort of a major move obviously it follows it pretty closely but that worked out well for me just 
following NVIDIA with SPY, it sort of lags, in my opinion, just a second or two. So it's a little easier to catch than SPY. But it's just something that's worked for me. All right. Here's an, oh. another, like, the my joke of the podcast is that I have all these people on and I ask them all about them. And then at the end, it just turns into, like, a personal therapy session for my own <laughs> training. They call me Dr. <laughs> LED sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it happens 10 times out of 10. Um, what do you guys think if I am interested in options and I've obviously interviewed like 25 people who trade options <laughs> in my, it's just like, they do not work with my mind. Like I was saying, like I look at a pretty chart. It just is easy, easy for me to do. And I no matter how many people I talk to and how much I try to understand it, just like cannot figure out options. Do you guys think that that's something that I should just like hunker down, try harder, like work more at? Or do you think that that's just kind of a thing that maybe they're not for me? One million percent. <clears throat> and this is coming from someone, Blaine, who was obsessed with the penny stock market, the small caps. Honestly, it still is to this day my strength. I've become a pretty good options trader as well, but you know, those pennies and those small caps, I've really hammered them down to, you know, pinpoint accuracy, I feel like at this point. But the options yeah. game allows you when you're having like a hard time, like this past week, it was a tough market. It was I didn't make and I didn't really take any trades in small caps because again, it didn't meet that criteria that I set. But it allowed me to shift to options, having, you know, sort of, I call, call it the tool belt. I have multiple tools in the tool belt. One is small caps, another is large cap options and large cap puts, uh, not puts, but shorting, I call it. So, yeah, I think that would be definitely useful for you to get into for sure. And so, like what, I how before, do I do that? Like, ha, like, how do I, how do, what is the best way to learn how to do them? Because I thought that the best way, and I've said on the podcast before, if you want to trade options, buy an option. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I have traded options, but I just like kind of the, it is if people are bringing, you know, I feel like I, and it's the first time I've picked up a basketball and I've been put into an NBA game. Like I just don't, I just don't understand it. Blaine, some some Socratic dialogue here. All okay. right, my favorite. Why don't you Why don't you tell me? Define the one thing, or if you were to summarize it in one sentence, what about options confuses you or doesn't work for you? I I don't know how to trade them on Thinkorswim, and I feel really strong with my trading on Thinkorswim now. Okay. And I, so I have to trade them on my Weeble on my phone. I do. The, that's how I trade them. I was going to tell you okay. to just do a Weeble phone. Yep. That's I what do I do it. too. Okay. <laughs> do we okay. all use Weeble for options? Yes. 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 It's, it's so quick. You just slap the ass. It's so quick. In. It's so quick. <laughs> Alex, okay. But give it out here giving great advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All in at the ass. Thirty percent spread doesn't matter. You're in. <laughs> okay. I'm not missing a ripper. <laughs> <laughs> then I guess I don't know. Woo, you, this is a lot of transparency. Um, I don't know how to use stop losses on the Weeble. So then I get scared. I I will just tell you two things that I would do if I or three things. One stop losses for me, I don't use them. Like when you put them in manually, they'll sometimes will go over your stop mm -hmm. loss and you won't get filled and then you got to go back in and cancel it. So that's like the one thing with Weeble phone app that's a little slow. So I just mm -hmm. do it all manually. So if you're watching it, I wouldn't use one. Number two, um, you need to set out a risk management plan. Like Adam said before, a lot of people will let losers, especially with options because they're volatile, they'll let them run to the downside, but they will cut profits early to the upside um, because you have a lot of volatility, right? It, especially mm -hmm. when transition, transitioning from small caps. If you have a 14% gain on a small cap, that's like insane. Whereas if you have that in an option, you know, you, you kind of got to just get used to how different that is. 
And number three, I would just honestly give Adams, I'm not even like just gassing him up because we're friends. Bro, bro. <laughs> gas him up. <laughs> gas him up. <laughs> Look at his watch list. I'm looking what at it right I now. Do, you said you use Think or Swim. Do you use the price level feature? No. Okay. So if you go to drawings up top right, um, uh-huh. on the TOS uh, web app, go to price levels. And all I do is I take his call trigger level and I just double tap it right at the, that price. And I could all show you this like off grid too. Yeah. And then I turn that one um, into a green color. So that lets me know it's the call trigger. And then I'll do the same for the put trigger and I'll make that one red. And not even like necessarily, you don't even necessarily have to take them, but just have those up on your screen and start watching how it hugs these levels that he draws out for you. And you'll start just recognizing like, this is where the key move is going to happen. And if you could hone in and find good entries, like Adam talked about before, like you'll mm-hmm. become honestly unstoppable. Uh, it's tough at first. I, you know, I've struggled in the beginning, but I've gotten a lot better with it. You need to use like five minute confirmation candles so you don't get faked out. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is just reps. Just, and again, you don't have to sacrifice your account in the process. You could do paper trading or you could even just play with very small amounts, like one contract. But I think reps is just so important. And you'll, Adam is a great place to start. He puts those out pre-market so you could chart it out before the day even starts. Yeah, I put I put okay. them out at night. So what I would say is, you know, I can I can picture where your where your head's at, right? You know, you're intimidated by it. It's I know that I can lose thirty percent in about two minutes, right? Right. <laughs> That's scary. Um, but the best thing you can do is just try to slow it down. Uh, you know, it's it's just like you, you're a high schooler, and suddenly you get you get drafted into the NBA, right? <laughs> like right. you said, um, try to slow it down where you can. Just like Coach said, take one contract here. You know, just watch the screen, watch how the the contracts correspond with the levels, and watch how you know, watch how the spreads move because those spreads between the bid and the ask, they just like Ellis said, you know. I'll buy the ask and I'm already already down 30%. Great. Yep. You know, <laughs> yeah. you got to watch those. There's a lot of things and options that you can just watch, right. And still learn in the process of watching. Um, I would say, I mean, for me, I would, and I play my watch list every day with options. It, it's important to just tune out the noise because if you're seeing somebody calling it on Twitter, then they're already in their followers are already in and they're selling their contracts to you. <laughs> so if you come in with a play with, with a plan, like coach said, you have your predefined risk, have your predefined scaling and prepare yourself for a consistent outcome. You'll, you'll find yourself going into a trade more confident than you will. If you go in with no plan at all. Yeah. So from, from a basic perspective, like trying to keep it as simple as possible, that's what Adam does. I use his two levels on the stock, the five stocks that he has. I will, and then I'll chart out yesterday's close. That's one of the key levels I use. I'll do yesterday's low and yesterday's high. And then I'll go back on the daily chart and see if there's anything like super significant. Um, and, you know, maybe a fib level as well. But usually, you know, you have those four or five levels. And those help me with, you know, when it does break Adam's level, where can I scale? Is it going to test yesterday's high? Maybe I want to, it just broke out. I want to scale like half there, for example. But again, just simply charting those out will help mm-hmm. you so much. Just start visualizing and seeing how, how things react at these levels. Well, I think, I think that that's one of the, I think that visual piece is a huge blind spot for me is kind of like seeing how the option like I when I'm trading comments I'm looking at the chart and I understand like the price is going up like I understand all of that and the like visual piece of options is a grayer area for me like do you Mm -hmm. understand what I'm saying yes yeah and that feels like a weakness mm -hmm. um Best thing I would say there is, again, paper trading can probably be a a great way to just kind of learn up on this is Mm -hmm. 
visualize, you know, how does my P and L on this, on this contract, how does it move with the price? And so what I do is I play weeklies. I really only play weeklies because these levels are, are meant to be the next day only, uh -huh. but everybody has totally different ways to play options, right? This is just what I choose to do because I want the move to either happen or it doesn't. I'm looking for an entry as close as possible to my level. Like ideally it's one cent above my level. I get a five minute candle to close. Boom. I take an entry. It drops mm -hmm. below. I sell for minus 5%. If I am probably less, if I keep getting continuation, then, then boom, you know, I have a break even stop and I'm in the green. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I don't even mean to gas my myself, Adam in the discord again, but you honestly should come in and live trade with us. And I think you'd get like a great experience out of it because we seriously, it, it's hard for me to say, you know, exactly what you should do right now. But when the trade right. is in front of me, I could at least walk you through, you know, my, what, what's going on in, you know, my head and what I'm seeing at least. And Adam hops on there all the time. It's great. So it's a good, like learning conducive place to, for options traders. You know, I interviewed somebody one time who was talking about his mentor and he was like that he was just like the kindest person and he would just like take our hands and walk us through it like we were children. And I was like that like that is I think kind of where I am because I've had so I've had so much information really because of the podcast, but like learning all of these different things. And I, it's, I've gotten to the point where I'm so like overwhelmed with information that I kind of need to strip everything away and yeah. just like go through something very systematically in a way that like would build some confidence. I love that. Yeah. Uh, you eloquently stated. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. To the Did new Discord, it? baby. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> uh, Blaine, quick question for you. Uh, do you sure. use Weeble Desktop? Uh, I have it, but I I don't like Weeble. Okay. Uh, but I have it. So when you're trading options on it, pull up the one, like the put the, so you're going to use Adam's watch list tomorrow, right? Put those five stocks on one. I know you have like 10 screens. I've seen your setup. Have mm -hmm. Weeble in the corner. Badass. Have your have your 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 option chain open and those levels, and they just click buy, and then no indicators, just the the green line and the red line, and that's all you got to do. Like that's pretty much my setup when I'm home. I don't have like I got like the ADMA and VWAP, but I don't listen. I don't use that for penny stocks. It's just on there because I'm too lazy to turn it off. That's all you got to <laughs> do. Hits the level, look for a retest, buy one contract, just one, not ten, just one. And then ride it up, get twenty percent, sell. Then you do that enough enough time, you start getting more and more confidence in it. That's what options all about, right? Because I know people who hit click buy and it dropped fifty percent. Okay, <laughs> like and it they happens. hold. Yeah, and they hold. Like now, I, I remember one time I meant to buy three Apple like Lottos on a Friday, and I bought three hundred and thirty three one time. So, Whoa. Sure, that, of course. That, that, of course. Oh yeah, that was a real bad day, dude. That was not man, no Gucci backpacks that day. <laughs> <laughs> But that's all you have to do. A lot of people overcomplicate options, but I think it's better for new people to trade options than small caps because small caps are very pump and dumpy. If there's no MOMO, that's what it is. And then large caps, you can trade every single day, no matter what day. Red, green, purple, orange market, doesn't matter. You can still trade them. Well, and, I also yeah. have in my Weeble account, I have like $3,000 that if it went away tomorrow would be Fine. Like I am more than happy. No, we're to doubling lose that. it this week. What do you mean? My, but, <laughs> Adam has a like, watch list. Like we're in double it, triple it. Hell, we're in a quadruple it. Mindset. <laughs> we're not right. scaling until we see at least a hundred percent. Yeah, if there's three thousand percenters on my Twitter feed this week, Adam, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Did somebody say uh, full port uh, build a bear? Oh, nice. Ooh. <laughs> okay. well, guys, I have kept you so long and for personal reasons, like Ellis, every freaking time you're on the <laughs> it's podcast. It's my fault. I know. I but... know. I'm like, I got to use this just for me. Um, I'm sorry. I kept you guys so long. I am so, oh, no. so no. impressed with both of you and your, um, humbleness and honesty and genuineness. It is. 
I, this was delightful. And I, I'm honestly so thankful I got to live this conversation. And I, <laughs> I'm definitely going to listen to this episode again. You guys are amazing. I appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it, it, it's truly been an honor to be on here and have loved getting to talk to you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I've honestly had a blast. Ellis, it was nice meeting you, talking to you as well. I mean, it. I feel like we have very similar like mindset when it comes to trading, and you guys seem pretty transparent. So that's that's awesome. Pretty? No, like extremely. <laughs> she was a wire. I love it. You two are very yeah. professional, uh, I must say. You guys are the same age as me. I'm 25, so we're in the same age group. And uh, I can just hear from your voice. You're very knowledgeable. You're honest. And that's all I really look for in people, and, and I really feel that you guys are great. So hopefully people are learning stuff in your Discord. We'll send Penny over there, and she can report back to me on her 1,000% <laughs> rippers all week. So. <laughs> yeah, thing. i, I got to throw in one more, one more piece that I think could be useful to your followers. So this isn't like a promo or anything. It's completely free. I did make um, a Google Doc PDF. It's like 40 pages and it has like everything about my experience. And so it has a table of contents with, you know, my trading style, my strategy, some of the strategies I use with like chart examples, uh, my risk management, like rules, um, all the indicators I use, my setup has information on like conquering PDT because I know a lot of people struggle with that. So there's some like tips and tricks on how I got over 25K um, and then building a watch list. So there's a lot of good information. If you did want to like share that with your followers, I feel like it could be useful to people who are new for sure. Absolutely. I want to get with you after and put together, like I can put in the show notes, all these links and we've referenced a lot of really good stuff. So I really want to build all that out and put it with this show, if that's cool with you. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of good charts on here. A lot of people ask about the morning flush. Um, so yeah, there's just great information. It is an incredible resource. hundred percent agree. Awesome. Awesome. I can't wait to look at that. All right, guys. Well, um, you know, you are, this episode is coming out right at the end of season two. And Thanks to Penny's Going in Raw, we get to have a season three, and you guys are really on the top of my list for people that I want to come back for season three. So I hope you will. Let's do it. I'm very <laughs> down. Thank cool. you so much. And All congrats. right. Yeah. Congrats on <laughs> Penny's Going to Raw. That's insane. I know. Isn't that it? Just it so like feels like the universe just smiled on me there. Yes. I really, I really love Dan and you really and- needs to unblock me on Twitter. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he really, like, I'm just gonna, you can leave this in there editor. He really needs to unblock me. Same with PJ and Gary. They all have me blocked on Twitter. And still to this day, I don't know why. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Well, I trade options. I don't even talk about petty stocks. Oh, it drives me nuts, dude. So <laughs> <laughs> shameless well, plug. <laughs> well, I have a, uh, I have a lot of respect for both those guys Absolutely. and I I feel very lucky that they are helping me do a season three. So, all right, guys. Well, um, fingers crossed for that Santa rally and I guess I'll see you guys in the morning. Absolutely. Good luck this week. Let me know how it goes and we'll definitely stay in touch again. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. Thank you both. Have a great week, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you to our producer, Joel Edwards and Chesley Lowe for the banjo music. Please like, subscribe, and share this on social media. We appreciate you guys. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that the Penny Lane podcast makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional or financial advice. Unless specifically stated otherwise, the Penny Lane podcast does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast. And information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement. The third-party materials or content of any third-party site referenced in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions, standards, or policies of the Penny Lane podcast. The Penny Lane podcast assumes no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or completeness of the content contained in third party materials or on third party sites referenced in this podcast or the compliance with applicable laws of such materials and or links referenced herein.